Intel's CEO delivers bad news. Data centers are coming in conflict with their neighbors. OpenAI's $3 billion acquisition of Windsurf falls apart at the last minute. And AI shocks some of the world's best mathematicians in a confidential review. Welcome to Hashtag Trending. I'm your host, Jim Love. Let's get into it. Intel's CEO made a stunning admission in a speech to his employees. Intel has fallen off the list of the top 10 semiconductor companies, and it's too late for Intel to catch up with NVIDIA. Anyone listening to or reading the tech news would be aware that Intel was no longer the leader, but just how far they've fallen was a shock. Lip Bhutan, the CEO, made the comments during an internal meeting this week, and they got leaked. He said, 20, 30 years ago, we were really the leader. Now, I think the world has changed. We're not in the top 10 semiconductor companies. Now, that's stunning from a company that used to own the chip industry. Do you remember Intel Inside as a stamp of quality? But it gets worse. By Tan also saying that it's too late for Intel to catch up with NVIDIA in AI training chips, he's basically giving up on the most profitable part of the chip business. The numbers tell the story. Intel is worth $100 billion today, half of what it was 18 months ago. But NVIDIA hit $4 trillion this week. And the bleeding continues. Intel lost $16 billion last quarter, despite spending more on R&D than NVIDIA and AMD combined. So what went wrong? One guess is that Intel just got comfortable. They made tiny chip improvements for decades while dominating the industry. They didn't see AMD coming with better processors. They missed the AI boom that made NVIDIA a giant and their own factories became a liability when competitors started using better foundries. They believed their own PR. Now, Intel is laying off thousands and outsourcing a third of their production to the same Taiwanese company that makes chips for their rivals. Tan's plan? Focus on the AI that runs your devices instead of chasing NVIDIA's cloud business. It's smaller, but Intel might actually have a shot there. He's called this a marathon turnaround where Intel needs to be humble. For a company that used to dictate how the chip industry worked, that's going to be quite a change and quite a challenge. We've all heard the hype about data centers and the economic boom that they can bring to communities. But the reality for people living next to these massive facilities tells a very different story. The BBC did a story on Beverly Morris in Georgia who lives 400 yards from a meta data center. And she told the BBC, I can't drink the water. I can't live in my home with half of my home functioning and no water. And her water woes happened just after the new data center moved in. Now the company denies it and pulls out studies that back up their claims that they aren't responsible, but yet Morris's claim is credible. These facilities can guzzle millions of gallons of water daily to cool their servers, rivaling entire town's usages. But the problems go beyond water issues. Those counties that thought data centers would create jobs and offered them tax concessions and subsidies in return have been gravely disappointed. The reality is that most facilities employ only a handful of people. Some estimates are between 6 and 30. That's it. Why? They're highly, but they consume massive amounts of not just water, but also electricity, taxing local utilities and requiring expensive upgrades to water and power transmission and generation, and still often have to run diesel backup generators that pump out toxic emissions. Recent studies found that air pollution from U.S. data centers could cause between 1.5 and as high as potentially $6 billion in public health damages in 2023 alone. Some think it could hit $20 billion by 2030, bringing health issues from fine particulates that will trigger asthma and heart attacks. Now back to the story of Beverly Morris. There is the question of what happens to property values. 
While some areas see increases from development, residents near industrial-scale facilities could see their home values plummet, especially if stories like Morris's are widely spread. And it's not just water and pollution. There are reports of constant humming, diesel generator testing, and industrial areas, to be frank, don't exactly scream desirable neighborhood. And maybe that's why many centers are being built in depressed or lower-income communities where property values are already lower and residents have less political power to fight back. And the problems may get worse as these centers struggle to get enough power to keep running. Elon Musk's new mega center has been running backup generators until they can, wait for it, assemble an entirely new power plant that they are importing from Europe. Virginia just had to grant emergency permits allowing nearly 300 data centers to run their backup generators more frequently because the power grid can't keep up. And residents are feeling that they're basically becoming guinea pigs for an industry that seems to them to be prioritizing digital infrastructure over their community health. Companies promise they're investing in cleaner technology, but the current pace of growth is outstripping any environmental improvements. But even though the data center boom has potential issues, the demand for processing means it's unlikely to slow down, regardless of environmental issues. OpenAI's $3 billion deal to buy AI coding startup Windsurf collapsed on Friday. But it also has a twist. Google immediately stepped in and hired Windsurf CEO and the top talent in what they're calling a reverse acquisition. Don't buy the company, take the top talent and license their products and services. But the deal and Google's tactics reveal two major cracks forming in the AI industry. First, we've talked about the rift between Microsoft and OpenAI, but it appears to be growing. The WinSurf deal was a major sticking point in their contract negotiations. Microsoft currently has access to all of OpenAI's intellectual property under their partnership agreement. But OpenAI reportedly didn't want Microsoft getting WinSurf's AI coding technology, perhaps because they want to compete with Microsoft? Think about this for a second. OpenAI is basically trying to hide technology from its biggest backer and partner. This is not the behavior of companies with a warm, growing relationship. And there have been reports that OpenAI executives have even discussed accusing Microsoft of anti-competitive behavior and filing federal antitrust complaints. For a company that owes its existence to Microsoft's billions in funding, that's pretty remarkable. But it's not an empty threat. Antitrust is a big deal. Google has been through at least two court cases in the U.S. that threatened to split up the company, and there are more threats in Europe. These tech giants are getting nervous about antitrust scrutiny. Remember, Google didn't actually buy Windsurf. They just hired the key people and licensed the technology. This is the new playbook. Get the talent and the tech without the full acquisition that might trigger regulatory review. It's not a new strategy for Google. They did the same thing with Character AI's CEO. Microsoft did the same with Inflection's founder. And these reverse acquisitions let them build AI dominance without technically creating monopolies, at least on paper. But here's what nobody's talking about. Windsurf and its shareholders are probably going to get screwed by this deal. Other startups that went through these talent raids saw their businesses collapse. Scale AI lost customers after Meta poached their people. Inflection had to completely pivot after Microsoft gutted their team. So the bottom line, the biggest AI companies are playing a shell game, avoiding antitrust rules while building oligopoly control, and their partnerships are falling apart as they partner but compete viciously for AI dominance. Scientific American reported on a secret meeting where 30 top mathematicians tried to outsmart OpenAI's latest AI with the hardest math problems they could think up. The AI blew them away. And we're talking about problems that would take human experts weeks or months to solve. AI knocked them out in a few minutes. One mathematician reportedly gave the AI an unsolved problem from number theory, PhD-level stuff. He watched the AI spend two minutes reading up on the field, then say it wanted to try an easier version first to learn the approach, 
Five minutes later, it solved the original problem and basically told him, no citation needed, I figured this out myself. Apparently, this AI, reportedly OpenAI's O4 Mini, not only has ability, it also has attitude. After two days of trying, these leading mathematicians could only manage to create 10 questions the AI couldn't answer. One researcher said working with it was like having a very, very, very good graduate student. Nah, actually better. And this can't be dismissed as fancy pattern matching. The AI appeared to show evidence of real reasoning, breaking down complex problems, learning from simpler ones, applying that knowledge to harder challenges. That doesn't mean we should stop looking critically at reports of what AIs can do. All too often, companies report the good news or skew their results. Elon Musk recently claimed that his Grok 4 was smarter than PhDs, and in terms of knowledge retrieval, it probably is. But we'd have to see where it would stand on an evaluation like this one. Confidential, no previous learning involved, and the experts posing the challenges. Where we are with artificial general intelligence is still an open question. But we are either at the point or getting close to the point where AI is simply smarter than the smartest humans in many areas. The next question is, how far along are we on what some of these mathematicians claimed to see? Genuine reasoning and not just sophisticated copying. And finally, an update on that Rogers Starlink satellite service we talked about. Somebody has spotted it in the wilds of Canada. A Reddit user in Northwest Ontario posted a screenshot showing Rogers satellite on their phone. They couldn't connect yet, probably not enabled on their account, but their phone could see the network. So it appears that Rogers is testing their Starlink partnership. The service is proposed to work with any LTE phone, giving you coverage where there's zero cell service. And it'll start with SMS and emergency calling, but then expand to full data coverage anywhere Starlink satellites reach, which is basically everywhere. T-Mobile is doing the same thing in the U.S. for $10 to $20 a month. And unlike Apple's emergency SOS that only works on iPhone 14 and newer, Starlink will work with any LTE phone globally. Those of us who live in rural areas where there are huge gaps in cellular coverage, or those who like to explore Canada's vast outdoor wilderness, will certainly welcome this service. And that's our show. A note to say thanks to those of you who came to see me at the Minden Bookapalooza, where I was pleased to present my new novel, Alyssa, to an enthusiastic audience and share the floor with notable writers like Robert Sawyer, a Canadian sci-fi legend. And if you missed the show but still want to read about AI, romance, mystery, and maybe even some hope, check it out at alyssabook.com. That's E-L-I-S-A book.com. Elisabook.com. Or you could find me on Amazon as Alyssa Jim Love. Great reading for the summer on the dock, along with your favorite Robert Sawyer book. I highly recommend his new book, The Downloaded. And in that spirit, whatever you're reading this summer, and Sawyer fans will understand this one, live long and prosper. And have a marvelous Monday. <laughs>